Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. This is the Plant-Based Business Hour. It's lovely to have you with me today. Thanks for being here. If you've listened to the Plant-Based Business Hour podcast before, then I will say go give us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help. Uh, as you know, on this show, we talk about the future of food, innovation, what's happening down the pipeline, where are plant-based products going, what about cultivated meat, what's coming down the pipeline. Well, what haven't we seen? cheese. Where is that cheese? We all want cheese. If any of you are vegans out there, you know that the reason people say like, oh, I will go vegan maybe one day, but it's the cheese that holds me back. So let's get the answer to this. Why don't we have better cheeses out there? We do have plant-based cheese, most definitely, but most people say it's not exactly what they want. So let's talk to the leaders in the newest space around cheese and milk and yogurt, bringing real authentic dairy without the animal. I'm going to bring on my five guests today. I've never had a show with so many people, so hopefully this is going to work out. I want to introduce each and every one of you, and hopefully I'm getting your names straight. So uh, Jason Rosenberg, you are the head of business development at Remilk coming to us. I think you're in the U.S. today, although Remilk is in Israel. Uh, are you in the U.S. today, Jason? Nope, I'm, I'm in Israel, about 20 minutes south of Tel Aviv. Thank you for being here when it's so late at night for you. I'm so happy to have you here. Jevin Najaraja, the co-founder of Better Dairy. I think you're tuning in from London. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, greetings from London. Oh, so happy to have you with us. Uh, such amazing work that you all do. Hille Vanderka, the chief operating officer of those vegan cowboys. Some very fun marketing there as a marketer myself. I love what you guys are up to. Uh, thank you for joining us, I believe, from Belgium today. Yes, well, right on the border of Belgium and the Netherlands. Yes, yes, such a beautiful spot in the world. Um, Inya Rodman, hopefully I'm saying that right, Inya Rodman, co-founder of New Culture. Thanks for being here today. Where are you coming to us from? Um, I'm currently uh, traveling in Europe, but uh, we are Bay Area based. Thank you yes. for having us, Elizabeth. Oh, I'm so happy that you're here. Yes, I knew you were in the United States, but I also knew that you get out and about quite a bit. So everyone's internet is working great today, which is how lucky for us. And then our truly hometown guy, Brian Tracy, he comes to us. Oh, wait, it could have been from the emergency room, which is literally where he came today. He came right from the emergency room to the plant-based business hour. So thank you, Brian Tracy, co-founder of Super Brood, for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here from Acadia, Maine today. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. Okay, well, let's get into it, folks. We want to know about where are we going with dairy. First, let me set the stage. I will grossly overstate what I understand to be the world of fermented proteins, and then we'll get in it, into it from there. So what we're looking at is a non-animal version of cheese or yogurt or milk. And the way that that's possible, as I understand it, is if one goes to a scientific database or the animal itself, and you take some of the genes, let's say from the hair, or again, this scientific database, and you map those genes onto a fungi, the fungi there for has sort of, for lack of a better expression, the cliff notes. And with those cliff notes, a uh, secret, uh, secret code, if you will, to creating the animal protein, that microbe can just prolifically create that protein. Then you've got that casein or whey, and you can add fat and sugar, and you have ice cream, or you can add cream and you have uh, yogurt or dairy or, or cheese. So um, I'm gonna first start with Brian because he does come to us almost from the emergency room. And I'll just a little anecdotal thing. Brian said to me in an email, Either I'm going to get out of the emergency room and I'll just make it in time, or I'm going to see if they're going to let me do the plant-based business hour from the emergency room bed. That is sheer dedication. So I will start with Brian. First of all, do I have that right? Is that what we're talking about with fermented proteins? Yeah, uh, that's certainly an approach. And I, I forego the x-rays to get to the more important things today. Um, but th th that's definitely an approach. But, and that's a life that I live, by the way, my entire life, the past 20 years in synthetic biology. But actually, super brewed, we take a different approach. We've harnessed unique microorganisms from different nutritional microbiomes, and we are using a whole cell biomass as a protein ingredient to make alternative cheeses. Okay, that's right. So just for the general public, we've got um, precision fermentation, and then you have biomass fermentation, which is um, a competitor, I hope that's okay that I name it, Nature's Find is, is already, I believe, to market. And you guys are right behind, if I understand that correctly, because Superbrood has some very big plants underway. Is that right? Yeah, we're about 
five months away from market. It's Nearing so exciting. Pretty close. Yep. Okay. Well, perhaps we can go through, since I'm starting with you, explain to everyone then what biomass fermentation is, just in case they don't know. Yeah. So instead of uh, having an organism produce a protein, a specific protein for you, we actually brew in a classic beer brewing sense, microorganisms just to proliferate and grow themselves. And that they themselves are a whole entire complex protein ingredient that bring in a diversity of proteins. And we also bring in a lot of boosted nutrition. For example, in addition to protein, one tablespoon serving of our ingredient will deliver you your entire daily serving of B12 vitamin, hmm. or will deliver you consequential amounts of B2 vitamin, iron, phosphorus, magnesium. So we're actually all kind of a whole food ingredient to go into a diversity of food applications, cheese being one, but you'll see us doing quite a few things in the next hmm. 12 months. Mm -hmm. And um, just a, a little bit of background for people. Um, I think people often think that animals and maybe even humans produce protein, but of course only plants and microbes produce protein. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, in, in a nutshell, much of the nutrition that we live off is not the food we eat, but the food being converted by our gut microbiome to deliver us the nutrition that we absorb. And so we went hunting through microbiomes of herbivores because herbivores are the planet's most effective converters of low value carbohydrates into nutritious high value protein. So we took that out of an herbivore system and we grow that in very large scale fermentations to produce what could arguably be one of the most nutritious protein ingredients as in our protein contents better than whey. And then the rest of our weight is minerals and vitamins that are extremely nutritious for humans. Mm -hmm. I want to boil this down for folks. What I love about what you're saying is inefficient converters versus animals, which are wildly inefficient converters and business markets like efficiency. Um, I, I think before we get into the heart of it, maybe we will have each and every one of you kind of explain where you guys are with your products. And then I do want to get down to like, why aren't we here already? Because fermented food, like you said, it's fermented just like beer is, that's nothing new. So Hinley, I'm gonna move it over to you. Um, those vegan cowboys focusing mostly on cheese, I believe, and it is precision, precision fermentation that you do, is that right? Yes, that's right. And um, well, I, I think it, most of the companies are, are using precision fermentation and we would like to use grass as a starting point. Just grass. like. The real cow, yes. Okay, so you're not going for the animal genes at all. You're going straight from the plant source. Yes, yes. Okay. That's what we're trying to do in the end, yes. Okay, Okay. and what will be the first product to market and when? Mm, well, it will probably take a few years for us because we have the development part, but also the regulation part in Europe. And uh, when we started, we said, well, will give us seven years and we are now in year two and one could say we're right on track and we take it slowly. We, we're not aiming to be the first, but we're aiming to be the most efficient. So and we would love to give it a try with grass and um, it will probably take um, another few years really to come to the market with our first product. But what we do in the meantime is that we already brought a vegan cheese to the market but not the cheese we will be known for as those vegan cowboys in the end but a vegan cheese brand with uh, all the ingredients which are already available right now and that's called wild westland and it's it's on the shelves right now we're really proud of that um but that's like what we will do in the meantime because in the end um well we want to make the real cheeses with those vegan cowboys. And actually we're not aiming for one specific cheese, but we want to do it all. Okay, so you intend to have a line of cheeses, but right now the cheese that you have, Wild Westland that's out, is that a plant-based cheese or is will it is it also a fermented cheese at this point? Uh, no, it's a, it's a plant-based cheese. It's and it's, but what we do with Wild Westland is that we bring the vegan cheeses to the market, the best there is right now. So we're currently looking at fermented cheeses already, uh, vegan fermented cheeses, of course. Um, and, and that's what we, whenever we find a new technique, 
we will bring it to the market. Yeah, it's very interesting that you have grass. So you really are a vegan product, I guess, for those who care and that you are not even looking to mimic what the animal does. I think that's a very interesting approach. Um, so I'm just going right down the line. I want to hear from Inya from New Culture. Um, you are also fermented proteins, I believe. If that's not right, correct me. And uh, when do you think you'll be in market and with what product? Sure. Um, yeah, so we are uh, definitely focusing on precision fermentation. Um, and as a company, we are uh, super focused on one particular protein type and one particular product. So the protein we're producing is casein. And it's because casein is the most powerful, the unlocking protein, uh, the only protein that can make the real um, dairy cheese as we know it of today. Just as an example, second group of uh, proteins in milk, whey proteins, um, very nutritious proteins, um, they're actually excluded from the cheese making process and they can only make a, a limited number mm. of uh, soft cheeses such as ricotta. But all the real hard cheeses, um, like Hilla said, you know, all of it, um, uh, those, those come from casein and that's what we're going after. And our first product is mozzarella because it's the most wanted, the most exciting, you know, cheese. Uh, we want to give the people phenomenal pizza that's animal free. Um, our cheese melts, stretches, behaves like real real cheese. And so far we've been able to make um, pretty significant amounts of casein and cheese already. Um, you know, we've been eating our cheese regularly and um, improving the product. It's been super exciting and we see being on market in roughly two years time, 2023. Okay, and do you see yourself as a CPG go to market final product, not a B2B because I know and after this phone call, let's connect. I know of several people that would like your casein for their own products. I don't know. Will you be selling B2B? Sure. So the, depends on what we talk about. We we might eventually be uh, thought as B2B in terms of selling our cheese in such a way because we will enter food service. Uh, we will first enter via partnership with restaurants. And we're already talking to a few select restaurants that we'd like to launch with. Um, however, we do not anticipate in the nearer future selling our casein. Um, okay. to other companies as a, as a B2B way. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, Jevin, I want to head it to you from London here. Uh, you guys are not focused on cheese, if I have that right. You're also fermented proteins, but it's really more a focus on milk. But you can correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me, when will you be in market and what will that primary product be? Yeah, so we're actually um, using fermentation, precision fermentation as the underlying technology. And like Inya, we're also going off the casein as the target protein. And actually, we are actually going for cheese uh, as, as well. the product. Yeah, there's, there's a number of applications of it. You know, as Enya said, there's whey, there's also casein. Um, there's loads of different products you could make with the two combined and separated. Uh, but we're starting off with casein because it's something that's so crucial for cheese making, as Enya said. When you're using precision fermentation to, to make products, you need to go after the highest value added ingredients, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, again, our focus on casein and going after cheese. And we're starting off with soft cheeses, but being a UK company, our dream would one day to be to go after something like cheddar, where, you know, it just resonates locally um, well with us. Um, will, will you be, any of you can chime in, but I'll say it first to Jevin, who's bringing me blue cheese? Who, where, who, come on, folks, when am I getting it? Yeah, we'll have to build up to that. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> it's tricky. Layer. <laughs> tricky business on the Five Base Business Hour. Jason, I'll throw it to you. Um, where are you guys at Remilk in your progress? When will the product be to market? And I'm guessing that it is indeed milk that's going to be the first product. Sure. So, um, I mean, we, we are focused on milk as well, uh, but using the same precision fermentation technology that uh, that others have spoken about here, we're, we're actually aimed at, at creating all of the different dairy proteins. And so the, those are the primary whey proteins and the casein proteins sort of, uh, um, as, as Jevin mentioned, to be able to mix and match and create the different products uh, throughout the dairy, uh, the dairy industry. Um, and so long term, we are looking at milk as well. But in the near uh, future, we're actually mostly focused on cheese, too. Great. Uh, yeah, just just as everyone else here. And um, I, I can't really give a, a set date uh, on when we will have mark, uh, press market, but but it is very soon. Um, and, and I think you'll actually be uh, be seeing some news from us uh, very, very soon. Wonderful. So very exciting. Okay. So it's great to hear all of this. Uh, either it's, you know, five months, let's say with Brian in market or, you know, a longer time frame for some of the others. But why? 
why isn't it here now? I realize I'm oversimplifying things, but we do have um, kombucha, bread, beer, kimchi, fermented is nothing new. We also have this in big pharma, insulin. If you get your insulin now, it is used through a fermentation process. It's not coming from pigs any longer in factory farms. That just proved to be a obviously a not uh, clean source. And the worry there was such that they wanted to bring it to a lab where everyone could be assured of clean sources. And so from the pharma perspective or from the food perspective, we have fermentation. I'll throw it to Hille first and then I'll, I'll throw it to a couple others. Why isn't it here yet? Hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting because we took over a lab who uh, the, the people were working on medicines. So uh, before this, they were busy with working on medicines and, um, well, our legacy company, the vegetarian butcher, um, uh, well, we were working on the meat. <laughs> so I can't talk for others why they were not working on this yet. But we were uh, working on medicines and meat. So um, You've been busy, yeah. basically. <laughs> oh, sorry. Like, yes. sorry, we've been slightly busy. I understand that. But uh, from the let's maybe take a step back from all of our companies and talk about the food market as a whole, it's surprising to me that we haven't gotten here before now. I don't know, Brian, if you'd like to take that. Yeah, so I turned 40 next week. I started working in fermentation at Nova Zymes 20 years ago now, mm -hmm. almost to the day. So I've been in fermentation my entire professional career. The economics are still challenging to com compete on commodity type proteins through a precision fermentation approach, because at the end of the day as well, most are probably using dextrose, highly refined glucose. Cost of these are not inexpensive. And cost of capital is very, very high. I mean, I've been in the, again, fermentation space through the ups and downs of Silicon Valley's woes of biofuels, which many people got their butts handed to them substantially to compete against commodity fuels with particularly recognition of hundreds of millions of dollars required to go steel into the ground to compete against commodity products in the market today with the same product. Mm -hmm. So we personally at Super Brood took a very different approach to say we don't intend to emulate an animal protein. We have no interest to make an animal protein. We intend to innovate. We make a better protein. So in terms of nutritional profiles and functionalities, we can go toe to toe with animal based proteins actually with better functionality. So when a consumer wants to adopt these new types of products, you're not competing in the market on the same benefits. Mm. ESG is good. Believe me, ESG is excellent. But a consumer wants performance in their daily consumption approach. They want nutrition, cleaner labels. They want enhanced properties when they go to cook with it in their own kitchens and so forth. So in our approach, it's taken us a bit of time because we went digging for a different protein altogether that can deliver new performance metrics. And frankly, it's off the grass AFCO QPS lists. So we have a oh. microorganism that's not building off of the experience of corn. Nature's Find has the advantage of using corn's 30 year of experience of using fusarium strains. We have no precedence for this microorganism that we produce to be used in our food system, even though it's native to every single human's nutrition today. So we go through an extremely rigorous series of regulatory toxicology trials, mm -hmm. allergen food trials, everything you can possibly mention because I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old and I'm sure as heck going to make sure every child on this planet is safe when they consume this type of a product that we'll bring to the market. And the regulatory aspect of it, I think, is one of the crucial issues that extends out the timelines to bring these new novel ingredients and technologies to the market. Yeah, so much to unpack there. Um, uh, Obviously, regulatory is going to slow things up, and I, I do understand that. Um, when you talk about competing toe to toe against commodities, you obviously, you know, you've got these commodities that are heavily subsidized. At least I'm talking about meat and dairy in the food world. So consumers care about taste, price, and convenience. So you're going to toe to toe, I guess, on the nutritional side, saying, "Hey, I've got benefits the other things don't have," but it has to be within a price range people can digest and understand. Um, at what point, I'll start with Brian, but then maybe I'll head over to Inya. At what point do you think you see price parity in this world? Yeah, that's a great question. 
and I, you know, I'm going to get ahead of my skis a little bit here because I have a history of being reckless in the outdoors. <laughs> um, and I would suggest that we will be cost parative towards, we'll, we'll be beating pea protein pretty substantially in the next when? year. And about the really? next next 12 months, yeah. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, and I think the folks in your your ecosystem need to realize, we make co-products, and that is what fermentation has survived off of to be competitive. When you crush a bean, when you grind a kernel, when you crush a pea, you're making a substantial amount of co-product, right? And one could argue maybe even three, four X, the quantity of animal feeds mm -hmm. that you're making as a co-product, which, which subsidies are true, but they have the economies of scale and the co-product advantage to have tremendous yields, huge yields. Versus when we're talking about precision fermentation, you're subsequently going to a system that's gonna give you 10, 15, 20, 30%, but realistically 10, 15% yield of sugars to protein with limited to no co-product. And by the way, that sugar came from grinding a kernel of corn in many cases, right? And so the yields off of these processes have a major challenge to compete against the commodity scale economics of crushing beans, grinding corn, crushing peas. So when we run our fermentations, we actually get 50, ish percent yield of product and our products that we make in addition to our protein is not 3x in terms of its quantity it's nowhere near 3x in terms of its quantity and it's a high value animal feed additive that we we put our co-product into to reduce antibiotic use in chickens and swine and so forth it's more complex but we think thought very deeply about these economics of how can we compete on performance with economics that will be competitive towards the plant-based world. And the plant-based world and the animal-based world essentially has benefited off of large economies of scale co-product systems. Okay, I'm gonna try to break, that down for, yeah. <laughs> to break that down for people and then I do wanna hear from Inya, but um, so you're saying you're producing product for people, you're also producing byproduct for animals. The equation of those two things together makes you profitable because of the yields you can get by the two products. Very basic. Have I understood what you've said? Yeah, but with a innovation on the animal side, it's not our goal to deliver animal growers low value macro ingredients, just fiber. We're giving them high value micro ingredients, additives that allow them to be more profitable off of growing less animal, off of being more efficient to use the amount of feed that they're using today. Because frankly, the global scheme of caring about the sustainability of all these things that we're doing, if we don't solve the animal husbandry issue simultaneously by getting rid of antibiotics, antibiotic growth promoters that are only being extended into emerging economies where way more broilers being produced than plant-based burgers being consumed in the United States. If we don't address these issues with delivering them better, more sustainable, natural solutions that allow them to be more efficient off of less and without exposing a greater part of the global population to antibiotics, then we're gonna miss the opportunity to really benefit the globe by only pertaining to a specific population who's consuming plant-based. So we deliver to the two megatrends across the globe, which also drives better economics overall to deliver a more cost-effective protein to the alternative protein consumer. Mm -hmm. um, Inya, let's pick up with you. Uh, so I would argue for just a non-animal solution if that's possible. I hear what Brian's saying about you need both economic strains to come through for your bottom line, um, but I do see a world where we could function without animals in the supply chain in general. You might always have that high-end market that is looking for something. But um, I'm wondering, Inya, do you see that as possible? And do you compare us to Big Pharma at all, which did get to a lower cost insulin for pigs? I'm not sure how they got there. And it could have been with a lot of government subsidies and research um, or the dollars that they had to spend as an industry to make sure that they got to market quickly and at a low price. So those are two very big questions. But we'll start with, can you see a world with... Um, um, out animals in the equation? Sure, I, I absolutely can. I wouldn't be doing this if I couldn't. And that is our vision and mission and our and our goal. And if we do anything less, we're 
um, disappointing ourselves and our and our customers um, as a company um, who is completely aiming to be animal free. Um, with regards to uh, that, that was, I guess, your, your first question, um, Elizabeth. I'd like to just briefly touch on the other two points, which were, Please. I believe, the cost and the and you know why why this hasn't been done before. Um, uh, some of the things Brian uh, outlined were absolutely correct with with the cost. There is a challenge with scaling our technology at a cost, but it's it's far from impossible. In fact, it's been done before, and it's been done in the last few years very successfully by several other companies in our space. Um, at the end of the day, it does come to a lot of um, pretty uh, innovative and, and hard work and um, achieving efficiencies across the pipeline. Uh, but most importantly, it really comes down to um, the microbes that you're growing being able to produce really large amounts of your, of your target protein. If you're able to achieve that, you are you're basically solving for the problem. And to me, this connects to why this hasn't been done before partially, because people don't talk about it much, but casein is um, a very different, weird, unique protein in nature. It exists only in mammalian milk. Uh, these are unstructured proteins, um, different to most uh, typically structured globular proteins in nature. And they are much more challenging to produce by precision fermentation than some other proteins. And I think this is why it's been taking us all as an industry uh, longer, but I think we're we're getting there. Um, certainly uh, at New Culture, we're we're seeing that we're um, making those breakthroughs, and I'm sure at, at other companies that are in this call and other companies in our field, um, that same things are happening. So yeah, I absolutely think we're going to get there. Uh, at New Culture, we project to be cost competitive within three to four years timeline, completely competitive to dairy of today, even if it was you know if dairy of today kept being subsidized the way it is um, by the government, which is. Uh, pretty crazy. And uh, while there is a lot of last 20 years, people are trying to make, you know, plant based vegan cheese using what is called complex protein. One of it is this um, kind of microbially derived biomass protein or plant based protein, but they're all complex proteins. They're not one single, you, you, one single um, unanimous protein. There are a bunch of many different proteins um, and they don't behave like casein. Um, so I really do believe there is a big advantage in, in um, what precision fermentation in this sense, uh, particularly for cheese, where casein is absolutely crucial to melt, stretch, to functionality. Um, so yeah, this is this is really what we're going after. We're going after making the best product out there and uh, really allowing people to make a no-brainer choice um, to pick it and to, to not to have to pick animals. Yes, uh, Godspeed. So I'm throwing it to Jevin. Uh, so I want to riff off a little bit of what Inya's saying and also what Brian's saying. So when we talk about price parity, the image I continue to have in my mind is beer. I see the big beer vats, and this is isn't this going to be brewed kind of in the same way? And what's so capital intensive about a beer vat? So obviously, I'm I'm missing the crux of the conversation. But is it? Um, where does the capital expense really come in here? Yeah, so I think that there's a couple of um, areas that capital expense come in. You know, obviously there's an upfront cost to R and D, and so there's money that's just being sunk into R and D as a general principle, sure. and that's something that over time we need to continue to invest in. There's capital cost also, I guess, associated with R and D. You know, you can get expensive lab equipment, and that you know takes some cash. Then when you're moving out of the lab and the R and D, you know, to the scaling upside. That's where you know it can get more capital intensive. You know, moving to these large you know fermenters, you know, or bioreactors, you know, can take quite a lot just to buy them, but also the operating costs of them can 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 mount up. And so I think for us, you know, we've been paving a way on how we can kind of drop that down. And you know, one clever way of doing it is potential strategic partnerships. You know, we saw recently Clara Foods, for example. Yeah. You know, they came together with AB InBev as a partnership. There's yeah. a lot of bear brewers out there. You know, we can try and leverage of existing infrastructure. And mm -hmm. so that's one way of us as a startup, maybe bringing down our capex. Um, mm -hmm. You know, aside from that, there's a lot of, you know, fermenters out there from the biomass stuff that, you know, Brian had kind of mentioned from the bio oil days, basically. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a lot of refineries out there that had kind of been unused now. And so there's a lot of assets there that we can potentially tap into. So I think that there are clever ways, you know, also private equity, tapping into that kind of money to kind of foot some of the capex costs. That's all things that are up for grabs. Yeah. And so there are solutions to it, but you know that's where the capex comes from, basically. Yeah, and are you find, finding a whole uh, ecosystem of suppliers 
to fermented protein makers. So people who are starting businesses around just the bioreactor for this kind of thing, are you seeing that develop or are you really seeing a repurposing of, as you said, from biofuel and others? Yeah, so there's a lot going on actually. It's coming from all directions. So you have some startups that are just buying, you know, beer brewing equipment themselves and trying yeah. to tinker with it. You've got other companies out there that are tailoring um, their current existing bioreactors and setup to then try and offer, you know, I guess, equipment to this new industry that's out there and a growing opportunity for them. And so I think it's coming from all directions. And, you know, coming back to some of the comments that are made, it really depends on the microorganism that you're using, the setup that you have, you know, that then starts affecting the kind of overall setup that you need. But yeah, there's a lot of different solutions coming out and it's a very exciting time, you know, not just on the biology side, but also on the engineering side and the scale up side. Yes, and we haven't even gotten to marketing. How do you market this kind of product to the consumer? And we will get into that for sure. Uh, Jason, I'm swinging round to you. So it seems that a lot of what we're talking about is a bespoke situation for the kind of microbe you're using. I think Brian used the word the microbe we're producing. When I interviewed Thomas Jonas of Nature's Find, he said the microbe we've discovered. I'm wondering if without giving away any IP, obviously. Um, what's the process for finding the right microbe that works for you? It sounds like all of you might be using different microbes, if I've understood that correctly. Jason, yeah, give us a so knowledge we, drop. Th thank you. So uh, I, I'll start by saying I, I would agree. I, I would assume that we're all working with different microbes. And even if we're working with, with the same original microbe, we've then uh, really, really Ed edited the microbe uh, in different ways to play with its efficiency and to play with its uh, its productivity and really create a, a little factory that can produce as much protein as possible uh, as efficiently as possible. And so that actually, uh, if I take one step back to the, the price parity and the cost conversation, I think that one of the reasons why we haven't gotten there sooner is really our, our ability to identify those viable sort of all-star microbes and then tweak them efficiently through time. And so a lot of that is associated with computing costs going down over the years and genomic sequencing costs going down over the years and data storage costs going down over the years that allow us to really test very, very wide arrays of different microorganisms and different combinations of adding this little genetic component and taking this out and really uh, pl playing with as many varieties as possible uh, until we can each identify really what works best with our own system uh, as as uh, Jevin said before, you know it's it's a combination between the microbiology and the engineering, and so uh, what what sort of crosses that bridge best for each of us uh, and the equipment that we're, we're working with, um, and and we, we've noticed it's not the same microorganism that produces each of the proteins at the same efficiency for us, and so uh, we really have to work with different ones and have to continuously uh, so, sort of search for improvements uh, so that we can reach that that cost parity. So that's fascinating to me. And I'm guessing, depending on the microbe that you use, you might have a totally different taste profile. Am I oversimplifying? Is, is that, so is that it, accurate? It, 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 for, from our experience, it's sort of, uh, I mean, that's part of the challenge, right, is, is, is making sure that that's not the case and that what we're ending up with is really just, I mean, in our case, we're working with whey and casein proteins. They're fairly flavorless and odorless and, and mm. sort of blank slates to be, to be built upon. And they're there primarily for nutritional and functional value. And so, um, you know, if, if we've done our job right, which sometimes includes a little extra purification, a little extra fine tuning later on down the road, uh, it, it, it really doesn't have a different flavor. It's, it's more a matter of who can do it the most efficiently. If we take the 10 options, who can produce the most? Yeah. Yeah, that's so awesome. And of course, it's hard for people to wrap their mind around, but we are approximately 7.6 billion people on the planet. We slaughter approximately 77 billion animals. When we're talking about quantity at efficiency, speed and price, it's critical because it's hard for people to understand. We're not talking about you and your and your farm of three chickens and is it so bad that you go fishing twice a year and catch three fish for your family on a family vacation? Certainly not how I'd spend my family vacation, but okay, that's not what we're talking about here. The scale of what we have to address is truly mind boggling. And um, so that's where that efficiency comes in. Um, you said a couple of things that I want to riff off of and then I'll get to other people as well. So you say, well, we might add a gene here or gene here or gene there. So is this going to fall under um, GMO? Probably. Yes. 
So for, from, our, from our experience, actually, actually no. Um, and, and this is sort of the split geographically, and, and Remilk has a very global outlook on this, and I think that, um, I mean, he was spoke on it a little bit before, but, but the Europe, Europe is far more conservative than, than certain other markets in the world, and so uh, the Europeans are still definitely testing the notion of this being considered a GMO. Uh, in, in the U.S., it's a it's a more clear route, and where we you know we, we can prove that as long as the organism does not appear in the final protein, right? And we've done our no. job of separating it properly. Uh, the protein is chemically identical to the animal protein, and um, what, one of the reasons why we're going after the sort of natural way and and case in proteins, um, contrary to, to sort of what Brian's saying, is is that it is a much easier regulatory route. Uh, these are mm -hmm. proteins that have been consumed for years, and as long as we create the same thing, uh, it's a much simpler process. Um, cool. Okay. Um, I, you're saying something that's reminding me of something that Brian said, so I'll throw it back to him for a second. But of course, if any of you guys have any comments on, on any of these, please chime in because each of your products will be a little bit different. But I believe you said, Brian, that you're going to get your price parity with pea protein pretty soon here. When I think of pea protein, I think of taste masking. Um, I'm wondering with for Brian or any of you in any of your products, it, it, um, Jason said that they're pretty neutral in taste, but I just wonder if these microbes have any uh, taste masking things that you have to contend with. Brian? Sure. Yeah. So that's a great question. So we are a complex ingredient, right? And so by, and maybe because there's a lot of juicy things, we can step back for a second. There's a very large difference, I think the audience needs to know, of fermentation versus bioreactors. Frankly, classically, the term fermentation is not being used correctly. Fermentation is a beer brewing process. It's anaerobic. So it's not possible, actually, to port the majority of precision fermentation processes into a beer brewing environment because you have to do a tremendous amount of oxygen delivery. And that's the precise, precise reason when you open up your, soda, sand, your can of soda or your seltzer water, all the bubbles wants to come out gas does not like to be in liquid. And since it does not like to be in liquid, there's a very high energy cost to put gas into liquid. And there's a law of physics that you're not gonna break in terms of the economy, the length scales that you can do that. So precision fermentation processes or fermentation processes that are aerobic would require smaller fermentation vessels with a higher energy cost to that to deliver gas, which creates a challenge on the economics to scale, right? And then also, too, afterwards, there's the separation. Downstream processing has long played the industrial biotech industry, long played it, plagued it, because you're creating something in an aqueous sea, and you need to remove a minor component away from many other biological components. So you have many different stages of separations, which require more capital costs, requires more washing, so forth. And, and we live this every single day. Wastewater treatment is a major issue, a major, major issue in food processing. And when you start making things from a biological system as well, you have to deal with all of the biological catalyst, all the organisms. So at the end of the day, it is true. Precision fermentation makes a non-GMO product, but you have a GMO organism that you have to deal with. Either you have to wastewater treat it, or you have to go through the regulatory pathways to get that into an animal feed somewhere which is the predominant pathway for all of these processes, right? So coming back though, when we're making a more complex ingredient, you're right, we have taste associated with it, which is frankly why we went into dairy to begin with. Our co-product, by the way, is butyrate. So in the future, we will move away from feeding that as a feed added to animals. That will be one of the biggest waves of postbiotics for functional foods for humans. If you look at prebiotics, almost every prebiotic is marketed on the idea of helping your gut microbiome make more butyrate. We will be the world's largest producer of butyrate very soon. Naturally sourced, produced for microorganisms, and we will take this into beverages, fruit drinks, smoothies, sauces, with the likes of the big food majors as well, right? And because of that butyrate, if you look at Wikipedia, it says characteristic scent, vomit. <laughs> In small quantities, it's butter. <laughs> Small quantities, it's <laughs> butter, it's savory, it's umami. So we have a buttery, savory, umami flavor to our protein ingredient, which actually functions very nicely into all alternative dairy applications and into HMMA meat applications, extruded type of products to make fish fillet, to make burgers, to make chicken nuggets, things of this sort. 
So we do have those flavors, but instead of trying to mask them, we try to use them to our advantage into the range of food products that they would already contribute beneficial aspects to. Okay, a lot to unpack there. And the easiest way to say it is if you are listening on podcasts, you should rewind and listen to that whole thing again. But I'll do my best here. It sounds like there are other economic streams coming to you. I'm happy to hear besides potentially co-product of animal feed, but you've got butyrate. And that's something very interesting as people are so concerned with their health coming out of COVID and their microbiome and being as healthy as they can be. Um, it, it also seems that your definite, your explanation, and I'll say again, just please rewind and listen to that because I won't do it justice, is, is why it's taking so long to get to market with this precision fermentation. It is much more complex than brewing beer. And perhaps that's not even the right way to look at it, I think is what you're saying. These are gross over oversimplifications that I'm trying to give the, the listener. But um, okay, so you do have taste coming out of the um, biomass products that you're using, and you're trying to work that to your advantage, which I think is, is very interesting. Now, when you talk about your products, I can see extreme differentiation of what you've got, you know, you've got butyrate, and maybe you've got this um, biomass product that has better nutrient profile than cheese, and maybe has this non-vomit, but but lovely buttery smell or taste. So I can see there, but for the rest of you, I'll start with Inya, um, but, but everyone just kind of chime in. Are you at all concerned about the competition of, um, you know, there's a couple other players who aren't on the interview today. The protein factory is one that comes to mind. I mean, so are you concerned that there's a lot of competition here and are you concerned about how you might differentiate from each other or are you just focused on differentiating from the animal dairy out there in yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, it would be, you know, unfair to say that we're never concerned. Of course, I think when, you know, all of us probably when we have a tough day, we're thinking like, Oh, you know what? I've just done this mistake and what have I done? You know, someone else is, I'm sure someone else is doing it better. Um, but overall, no, we really don't have those concerns. You know, um, w the competition that we have is just, I i don't know who even can call it. It's so much, you know, we are like 10 companies yeah. in the entire world and we're tiny uh, against the massive, massive dairy lobby. So I really do think that um, there is space in the market for all of us because if, especially if you talk about cheese, uh, the demand has been just outrageous, been crazy for like better cheese, right? Um, when you see any other alternative uh, uh, protein product coming out or dairy product coming out, people are just asking, but what about cheese? Where is cheese? So yeah, I do think market is so large and that if I'm honest, there is an opposite problem um, that, uh, you know, talking about scaling up that, you know, we're not gonna be able to even cover <laughs> significant part of the market, even if we use all fermentation assets um, and, and recovery assets that are worldwide. Um, we're going to struggle covering that. So I really do see uh, us together. We have to build a whole, you know, um, not new, but we have to keep expanding on the industry that exists for producing um, enzymes, insulin and molecules as such. We have to do it in partnerships with large companies. We have to do it to our advantage. Um, if we talk about differentiating, I would say, again, we are um, the way we're differentiating against dairy is that we are animal free. And that is really the, the only or the biggest differentiator uh, on top of that, there is this differentiator. It's important for a lot of people who can't eat lactose. We're lactose free, obviously, because we only produce protein, uh, protein from milk. But really what our goal is, is to produce ser same dairy identical products that if you give to a random person to do a blind taste on that, they just would think that, you know, this is cheese. This is just the cheese that I've been knowing uh, for years. Uh, in terms of differentiator of of us against others in the field, that's really hard to comment because none of us knows exactly what others are doing, which you know I'm sure we're all curious about. But we're I would just say we we are able to make casein, which really has no one has shown before, um, to my knowledge, that they've been able to do in, in large amounts so far. Yeah, it's so very exciting. Um, you've perhaps already answered the question, but I'll throw it to Hille. Does it ever happen that you end up collaborating with you know what could be seen as your competitors? But again, oh, yeah. you know. You do. So you are co collaborating yeah. with maybe even folks on this uh, conversation. Um, yes. Well, I, what I really like about the companies we are working for is that, uh, well, what, what, I've seen, what we've seen so far is that everyone is really open. Of course, we do not share our deepest secrets, but we work together on uh, all the subjects. We can work together, for example, the naming, for example, regulation. And um, that's really nice because 
I guess from the beginning, we're all mission driven companies. So in the end, at those vegan cowboys, of course, we love to go to the market with the best cheeses and, and become world famous. But to be honest, we would be thrilled if other companies succeed and we just stay pretty small. That's fine. And I absolutely agree with Inya that in the end, there's room enough for all of us. And um, what we've learned so far also from our legacy company, The Vegetarian Butcher, that it's great to work with partnerships. It's great to work with uh, people from the industry. We used to work with people from the meat industry. Now we work with a dairy company, Vestalon Cheese, which is now from old Amsterdam. And by working together, with them, we can really make a change. So we are not afraid of competition. We just befriend them. And you're saying that you're not even afraid to perhaps work with industry leaders no. if that's, yeah, if that provides better products, better collaborations, et cetera. Jevin, um, obviously we're talking about 10 maybe producers, like Inya said, around the world of these uh, fermented proteins and non-animal cheese, dairy, milk products. Uh, where do you think the dairy market is going in, let's say, 10 years? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. And so, like, you know, I, I guess I echo what um, both Inya, you know, and Hile said, you know, it's crazy how large the white space is here. Right. And, you know, I had a very interesting opportunity, you know, a couple of weeks ago to actually speak at this uh, Global Dairy Congress. And we we're actually speaking alongside some of the big dairy companies out there and like, getting their viewpoint on it and like how they're weighing on in on the whole thing. I think it's super interesting. You know, dairy as a whole, you know, as much as the work that we're doing, it's still growing, right? You've got a lot of yeah. growth happening in areas like China. You know, you've got Africa, you've got all these emerging markets that are upping their dairy consumption, whether it be through pizza and mozzarella or just pure mm -hmm. milk or milk powder or more babies and needing infant formula. You know, in general, it's growing. And so they are seeing it as we're coming in and there's white space for them, but we're taking like their white space. And so there's a yeah. lot of different, you know, I guess things there. And it shows the need for more companies to come at this. You know, all of us, I think that's why we're so collaborative. We want each other to succeed because that's the only way we'll actually make the impact that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. The dairy industry and the meat industry, if from what I can see, sees the growth of plant-based cultivated fermented proteins, cultivated meat as a yes and sort of the market's growing in general. So it doesn't really matter, if you will, that there are new players coming because in general, there's just a lot more market out there. The planet's going from 7.6 billion people to 9.7 billion people in less than 30 years. So, you know, it's a third percent of population growth on the planet. There's more people eating. In general, there's more people eating. And of that, they're going to eat meat and dairy. So there's lots of room. So it becomes a yes and not as much of a replacement. Although I will say the CEO of Cargill, obviously meat producing company, uh, recently said that they expect plant-based meats to be 10% of the market in three years and that that's going to be a cannibalization process. So that's the first time I've heard anyone from, I'll say, those industries. Um, acknowledge that there might be some cannibalization. So interesting to me to see that. Um, many of you might know prolific investor Jim Mellon. And when he was on this show, he predicted that the dairy industry as we know it will not exist in 10 years. Any comments? I'll leave it open floor. Uh, I'll start. I think it already is true. I mean, just in the United States, 13%, if not more, of the market's been taken over in the milk space by alternatives. So, I mean, is it going to continue to morph? Absolutely. And it's going to evolve based upon consumer preferences and global demands and so forth. I think the key is, again, to manage innovations and to allow them to come forward in reasonable time frames and to be supportive of them that make practical sense for the intended goals. But kind of already is happening. Yeah, it's really exciting to watch. And someone mentioned China um, increasing their dairy consumption. Now, let's think about that, folks. Culturally, they never ate dairy. And culturally, as I understand it, close to 99% lactose intolerant. And as um, they watch the West suffer from extremely expensive lifestyle diseases coming from the ingestion of animal proteins, you would think that the Chinese government would be saying, I don't want those costs. Further, one would look at the political landscape and say, you know, 
COVID showed us that pandemics disrupt job supplies and pandemics disrupt food supplies. And if any country is going to be politically stable, they're going to have to secure their food supply and not rely on trading partners of people who are perhaps orange and irrational that might not be able to trade with you. So you're going to, you know, if you've got 1.4 billion people, I would be looking seriously at these alternative proteins for my own political safety, as well as the healthcare costs. So, uh, the, the geo, geopolitical landscape of this conversation, I think, is very, very interesting. That's a whole nother show. Uh, OK, I, I want to throw it to Jason here. And hopefully someone popped off, but hopefully Jevin's going to be able to come right back in. Um, OK, Jason, and then back to Hilly and Inya and Brian. OK, so we have this landscape of all this great innovation. Well, how do we explain it to the consumer. So they can't stand the word GMO already. That's like, don't do that. So we won't go there. But we do have to find a way to communicate this. I know there's been lots of discussions around, is it non-animal, animal animal free, or, you know, and it seems like as as the 10 of you, you know, are deciding about being non-animal, but still the consumer doesn't like technology in their food, even though technology has been in their food for decades now. Um, That's how you get these prolific uh, crops being grown, et cetera. There's, you know, um, technology and the seeds, et cetera. So, um, but how do we go, starting with Jason, how do we go about communicating this new technology to the consumer? Sure. So I, I think it actually gives gives us a good, uh, or me, a good opportunity to talk a little bit about our business model as well and sort of how how we uh, view, view ourselves commercializing. And, and we, we look to remain a B2B ingredients company uh, throughout our existence. Oh. Uh, we, we, we really yeah. want to replace the cow in the, uh, in the function sort of, and, and, feed the dairy companies with their milk uh, that today they, they get from a cow, but tomorrow they'll get from us or, or other companies uh, like us. And I think that because of that, uh, we're actually talking about a, a partnership that, that's really uh, a very significant partnership between us and the, uh, the, the consumer-facing dairy companies. Uh, and so while we understand the technology and we understand sort of the, the, the mission behind this, um, they're the ones who really understand their, their consumers. Uh, and and, and I, I know I'm sidestepping for one moment, and I, I apologize for doing so, but just to touch back on the differentiator, uh, you know, I, when you asked beforehand, how do we sort of differentiate ourselves from each other? I, I think that those massive dairy companies have been working very hard for decades on differentiating themselves from each other. Uh, and, and we just look to feed them with the same base product and sort of leave that struggle to them. Uh, to understand their specific markets, their specific consumers. And we understand that when we're selling into a, an Indonesian cheese producer or an American cheese producer or a British cheese producer, the same cream cheese or cheddar cheese or mozzarella is actually a different product. Uh, and although they sort of fall under the same general definitions, each, each market likes something a little bit different. Uh, and so it's not only about sort of conveying the, uh, the, the, the safety and the quality of uh, of the process, but it's also really understanding what what each market wants. Uh, we, as an Israeli company, cannot on our own understand consumer preferences in Australia and 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 Russia and, and Brazil or or any other country that I could throw out here. Um, we, we we don't fully understand our own preferences. We're we're, we're consumers and scientists for the most part, uh, really looking to just pr- produce an ingredient. <sighs> So thank you for sharing that you are always going to be a B2B company. I think that's interesting. And I didn't know that about you. But um, and, and in being a B2B company, you can leave the end conversation with the consumer to your um, buyer, I guess it would be. But for your products that are going to market, do you see any um, pushback from the consumer about, oh, this is too much technology in my food? So I, I, my, my personal belief is that there will be uh, some initial pushback, uh, but, th- but that's sort of, if I, if I go back to what Inya had said beforehand about the fact that uh, n- not only are we happy with each other succeeding, but we'd, we'd, we'd really like for each other to succeed. I think that that's the only way that this really crosses that chasm is for enough of us to succeed simultaneously, get enough products to market, and, and really let, let the consumer become more aware of this. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we are talking about a product that at the end of the day is chemically identical. Uh, h- however, there's a, there, there's a mindset that has to, uh, that, that has to change a little bit. And, uh, those mission driven consumers, like those of us on this call and a lot of our, our maybe personal circles and networks, uh, are, are pretty quick to understand this. 
uh, and, and, and the general public, I think, will need all of us to succeed uh, at, at scale in order to, to really see that themselves. Um, I'll just open it up if anybody wants to chime in and I'll say that I see you have an incredible tailwind behind you because while people don't like technology in their food, more and more people are hearing somewhere in their circle, even if it's not our bubble within a bubble within a bubble, which is where, where we all live. But even people outside our bubbles are starting to get like, oh, wait, there's a connection between food, environment. We're living through another fire season in California. We have, you know, another hurricane season in Florida. So these things are becoming I think on people's general radars a little bit, not the, not our far away bubbles, but like the next bubble out from us that maybe didn't hear it before this year, maybe they're starting to hear it. So I think you have that incredible tailwind of people perhaps starting to be willing to try new things for the sake of themselves and the planet. There was a research, um, paper that came out and I'm forgetting the company, I apologize that put it out. And they were saying that about 86% of millennials were willing to try cultured meat, cultivated meat. That's obviously different than what you guys are working on, but it shows the openness and that they expected in, I think it was 30 years that 40% of the meat in their shopping cart would be cultivated meat. So um, you are you have new consumers out there as well as the younger generations being open to this. Um, we are tight on time. Oh, go ahead, please. Someone. Oh, in. yeah. I was, I was just trying to like, we are trying to make the story as familiar as possible. So um, we try to tell the story as it is not something really new. Like we introduced our own stainless steel cow, our very own Iron Lady, Margaret, and she's actually a fermenter, but she is a stainless steel cow. So what we do is that we tell the story of the farmer who, who gets out his, uh, well, dairy cows and brings in a very own Margaret. And if you tell a story like this, people really get it and they think it's fun and it's familiar. They know the process and, well, they have a positive connotation with it. So I think that's really important that you try to tell the story, which is really close to uh, what people already know about milk and cheese. I would just echo what Hila said, and, and that's why New Culture really, we are a fully uh, consumer facing brand, because I think it's really important to connect with consumers and, and um, really have a brand that people can love and trust. Yeah, I do have to say hats off, cowboy hats off to those vegan cowboys, because you've really brought it to a place that's non-threatening, very friendly, this idea of we're all still cowboys, don't worry, like we haven't changed, our lives don't have to change, we're just getting better food in a better way for us and the planet, and we're having a good time, we're still who we are, so um, I just so very fun. I. Um, I was gonna maybe switch topics, but I wanna let anybody else hop in on that consumer conversation if you want to. Brian, yeah. Yeah, I just wanna make a point. Uh, you know, We're differentiated as we discussed because we're not the same protein. And I think the industry though that's doing precision fermentation has a really big opportunity that I don't quite see yet, which is you have opportunities to be better. You have opportunities to recognize that the way you formulate it into food products or the way that you're bringing it to the consumer into their dishes through food service through what have you to be better and our belief is to really get the large bulk consumer base there's a portion that's the esg consumer and they're very oftentimes the, the early adopters but to move to 15 20 percent of the consumer base you need to be better nutritionally you right. need to be better clean label wise and you need to be cost effective obviously so coming at it from the perspective of what benefit Granted, 100% transparency, build a familiar story, but what benefits can you accurately convey and prove to a consumer as quickly as possible to get the every consumer, the everyday type of consumer latched onto your product? I'd love to hear that story from Precision Fermentation, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't quite hear it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love what you say because you really can, it, it's like a marketer's dream in a way because you there is so much there that is already naturally better. Um, and as people, again, this tailwind tailwind coming out of COVID, as people are reading labels, they're you know they really took their health seriously during COVID. They had the time to Google and start putting things together for themselves, no longer necessarily depending on their doctor or other people to make these decisions for them. They're really taking back the control of their health. So you know there's there's all of that to play off of. Does anybody else want to comment on that? 
Okay, moving right along. My last question before we kind of wrap up here, because I know you all have busy lives and I did promise you only an hour, but obviously the five of us together, my gosh, we could go on for a long time together. Um, what kind of support are you anticipating from governments, if any? I will say the US, I think, is painfully slow here. I talked about that geopolitical situation, so I'm very surprised that we're not more behind spending on research for our own food security. Uh, from the political standpoint, that's surprising to me, but there are other governments around the world which are being more supportive. What kind of support are you seeing from governments or do you expect to have from them and from the private equity market? I believe the um, amount of money from the private market spent on alternative proteins that's plant-based fermented and cultivated was in 2020 was more than all of 2010 to 2019 put together. And in a very short time, fermented proteins came from nowhere from behind to take about a third of those dollars. So I'm wondering, I'll start with Jevin. Um, do you think governments are going to start, you can maybe speak to the UK only, but uh, governments are going to start supporting and are you seeing even more private equity come to the table? Yeah, so we see ourselves, you know, very much as a global company, even though we're based there. And Oh gosh, I don't have your audio. So I think it's it, on my yeah. back now. I think that yeah, my back. computer's freaking out. We have a bit of yeah. a heat wave going on in the UK right now. So that could be oh, why that and the internet okay. potentially. Um, and by heat wave, that's 31 degrees Celsius in the UK. We're just not set up for it. But, um, Ouch. but yeah, yeah, but coming back to it, you know, we sell ourselves as a global company. We've got investors all the way from Hong Kong, all the way to the US. And with that, we've already started engaging with governments all over the world, including, I guess, you know, places like Singapore, which are making massive movements towards this on an investment, regulatory, consumer, you know, ecosystem side of things. Um, and so Singapore is a really good beacon of hope for everybody in terms of what the world could be. And then taking that in a UK lens, there's actually a real interesting post-Brexit opportunity that's emerging where the UK government is looking to actually potentially change their regulatory framework to actually capitalize on things like Brexit, which mean that, you know, the Europeans, which are more conservative now as Britain, we can actually shape some new policy and regulation to be more like Singapore. And actually, you know, regulations there for a reason is there to safeguard the consumers. But again, you know, revisit this regulation, which can be a bit antiquated or a bit too overarching and actually, you know, tweak it to actually foster this new wave of innovation. And so we've got really good access being here. I've actually even managed to speak to some MPs about it. And I think it's very exciting, you know, from a UK standpoint to potentially take an outsized role on this whole future of food sort of topic. Um, and then alongside that, there's other places like Switzerland that are making movements towards it. I've heard Canada is making movements. And obviously, mm -hmm. the US usually tends to move very quickly on these kind of things to capitalize on any technological innovation, as well as places like Israel. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, I do have to throw it to Jason because Israel is also just like Singapore is a role model. Israel's got that beautiful triangle of politicians, entrepreneurs and universities working together. So you actually already have the support of the government. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Israel is, is uh, I mean, we, we've been termed the startup nation for a reason. Uh, it, it is an extremely, extremely supportive ecosystem for development of new technologies. And, and uh, within a three block radius of where I am at the moment, uh, there, there are several other players in the in the fermented protein space, uh, both on the dairy mm -hmm. side and then the seafood side and the meat side of things and chicken. And, and we're all really uh, uh, sort of a, a part of the same uh, mission. Uh, together and, and there's there's a ton of support and, and the other that one that I would I would like to mention at this point is uh, I mean d d due to our recent uh, agreements which did make make world news uh, uh, with some of our some of our neighbors such as the UAE and Bahrain which were, were recently uh, friendlier with than than in the past um, the, the, these are countries that as well are dealing with a, a very uh, different issue as desert nations that have had issues producing their own dairy for for generations. Uh, and, and with a raise, rise in their adoption of dairy products as well, their governments are really looking to, uh, to incentivize the, the locally produced sustainable uh, uh, food. And, and this is an opportunity that we really provide that nature doesn't necessarily provide for the whole world uh, in an equal, equal manner. Um, and, and so we, we have the support, but we're also seeing a lot of support from our neighboring states, which is, uh, which is a really exciting thing for us to be able to work together with them and, and uh, you know, move this forward in the right way. I had, um, um, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Uh, Mr. Tubia on the show from Aleph Farms. And he said that 
the work that they're doing in cultivated meat was the best chance that there was for mid peace in the Middle East. So I thought that was very exciting to hear those kind of words coming from him. When you look at the kind of food insecurity, we're back to that topic again, um, that's happening in the Middle East. So uh, yeah, Israel, so well placed, at interesting times. But um, Holland as well, Hille, I know you're just on the border, really, you're on in Belgium, but Holland as well, I'm going to mispronounce it, so I won't even try the University of Wigger. Thank you. Oh. Give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> um, such it, um, innovation coming out of there. And I think there's support coming out of Holland as well. Yeah, I guess we, we, we see the support from the, from the government if you look at subsidies, for example. Mm. But uh, on the other hand, the regulatory part, well, at least for Europe, is a big challenge. So there are two sides to that story. Mm -hmm. um, but w w what it's, it, it's great to see that so many universities are working on this topic as well. So you really have the chance to work together, for example, uh, the University of Wageningen, which is really the vegan hotspot of Europe, yeah. I could say. And, uh, but also the University of Kent, for example, in, in Belgium. Uh, we work with them together as well. And, and these are very pleasant partnerships. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you mentioned uh, also the, the, the private capital. Um, what what we've we've seen we, we've been amazed about how many investors knocked on our door from day one, even when we didn't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, just a laboratory, some people working there, and the first investors uh, knocked on our door. So uh, it it is amazing how many uh, interest um, people have in yeah. what we are doing. Yeah. I and there's so much money out there right now for this. Obviously, we are in a secular trend and people can yeah. see the financial opportunity therein when you invest early on in a secular trend. So it's a very exciting yeah. time. Our last question, because I really have gone over and I know you all have very busy lives and going around the, the group here. One word answers for each of these two questions, if you can, or, you know, short sentences. I'm starting with Brian. What would you like to be known for if you think about your legacy? And what is your favorite snack? Oh, wow. Beyond Dairy would be what we'd like to be known for. And my favorite snack is actually our protein-based smoothie. Ooh, can I get my hands on that? Yes, I can. Okay, yeah, I can get I'm, that to you. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> uh, Inya, okay, what would you like to be known for? And it can be business or personal, however, you know, sometimes it's one and the same, just depends. Uh, and your favorite snack. Well, personal and a business, I think, aligns for me. I think we would be like to known for kindness and kindness for animals and humans both. Um, my favorite snack is just uh, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> Very, uh, maybe boring, but um, sometimes I'm aware of the impact there too. So I try not to eat much, but just, just chocolate, plainest, simplest, dark chocolate. Yeah, I think of chocolate as really my vitamin of choice. I, I depend on it. Uh, Jevin, okay, what would you like to be known for and your favorite snack? I want to make people vegan without realizing it. You know, that's what I want to be known for. I want to make the whole world vegan without even realizing that they've turned, you know, bloody vegan, right? That's what I want to be, you know, that's what I want to be known for. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that. That's actually a great <laughs> quote. I'm going to turn people vegan without them knowing that they're bloody vegan. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. And favorite snack? Oreos. I love, I, love, I love Oreos a lot, you know, and ice cream, cookies and cream, Oreos with milk, Oreos just by themselves. They're great. <laughs> It's funny. Oh, my word. I love it. Okay. Yeah. I've got a, a special relationship with Twizzlers. They're also vegan. Okay. Uh, Hille, what would you like to be known for and your favorite snack? Uh, as those vegan cowboys, we absolutely like to be known for freeing all cows in the world. Mm, and, my, and my favorite snack was, before I turned vegan, pecorino cheese. Uh -huh. So we need to hurry. Uh, yes, <laughs> I would agree with that because I'm still waiting on my blue cheese because no one has officially yeah. answered that question, which was early on in the podcast. Jason, we wrap up with you. What would you like to be known for and what is your favorite snack? Uh, you know, so, so sort of to, to follow up on something that Brian said earlier, I think I think that uh, our, our goal and my goal is just to do better. Uh, and, and that can be on, on lots of different levels, both in, in terms of the, the, the value and the, the environmental impact, but also cost and also uh, uh, the taste and, and experience that consumers have, but also just in, in life, I, I think we're, we're always looking to do better. Um, 
And my favorite snack is actually, I guess, I guess as the last sentence, I can say uh, that, that I'm not a vegan. I'm, I, I, I am a flexitarian, uh, but one of my weaknesses are Cheetos, and I, I'm a, a, a big Cheeto consumer. Uh, and, and, and can't wait for us to be able to provide some cheese flavoring uh, for snacks as well. A hundred percent. Hurry, 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 hurry. We're going to wrap it up there. I want to thank all of you. Let's just give shout outs again. Uh, Brian Tracy, co-founder of Super Brood. Inya Rodman, co-founder of New Culture. Jevin Najaraja, Najaraya, sorry, co-founder of Better Dairy. Hidley Vanderka, chief operating officer of Those Vegan Cowboys. Jason Rosenberg, head of business development at Remilk. I want to thank you all for all that you do for business to move the needle forward with innovation for people, the planet, and animals. I am so deeply grateful on a personal level. And as a business person, I love what you do. It's great, big, fat business. So Godspeed that you can do more of it. And I'd love to have you all back on in like six to eight months. This area is changing so rapidly. We'll all have more stories to tell in about six to eight months. So let's stay on each other's radar. And thank you for all that you do. For everybody watching on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, I will see you all next Tuesday. And you five, just stay put for two seconds as we end here. 